Uh, thank you, Professor, and, and uh, congratulations on your recent promotion. Uh, well deserved. And okay, so what are we talking about today? Um, yeah, okay, so I just want to start by reminding you what an exciting time it is to be a data scientist. So um, over on the left here is what computers used to look like when I started high school. That's an Apple IIe. Uh, it's got 64 kilobytes of RAM, and that image is about 200 kilobytes. So this poor computer doesn't have enough memory to look at a picture of itself. Um, these days, high schools, you, most high schools don't provide laptops anymore. They just ask you to bring your own, and people are probably going to turn up with something like this with, like, you know, more than a million times faster and more than a million times more memory. And I guess a lot of us would be using cloud computing, like, or, you know, computational clusters with, you know, thousands of nodes, which each have better specs than that. So um, it's just been a total game changer what's been happening uh, from, from one year to the next, really. Um, uh, and in terms of technological advance, and that really changes what you can do with data. Um, I guess it's changed things in two main ways. Uh, new technology gives us new types of data to analyze, uh, which each have diff may have new properties, the different types of properties than data we've come across before, which means that you need new methods to analyze them. Um, in uh, Mike's talk earlier, we saw uh, these drone footage with infrared cameras looking at, at koalas and, you know, like none of us, uh, th that, that sort of data wasn't available when any of us were in high school, um, right? So it's, that's, that's only a few years old, that stuff. And so there's always new data types coming around which can be used, which have different properties we need to think about when we're analyzing them. Uh, new technology also just changes the 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 changes the whole landscape in terms of what you can do with data. So new data means there's new methods you can use, maybe to answer old questions better, maybe to answer new types of questions uh, that haven't been answered before. So I call this talk "Mind Your P's and Q's When Analyzing Data." So the P's is the properties of the data, and the Q's is the questions that your question or questions that you are trying to answer. There's so many different approaches you can use to analyzing data and when thinking about what to do and when checking uh, through what you've done, uh, I think a, a good way to approach it is, is to try and mind your P's and Q's. Just think, what are the key properties of my data? Does my analysis method capture those? And is it answering the question? So I guess in this talk, I'll talk a bit about the properties, just how that can drive what you do. I'll talk a bit about the uh, how the research question uh, affects what you do and how you do it. And then I'll go through a few examples from my research group uh, where we are developing methods to better mind our P's and Q's. Okay, so you're sitting away, working away at your desk um, on you know some problem that's intellectually interesting, but no one really cares about. And then uh, someone walks into your office and they've got like, they got hat hair, right? So they just, they've obviously been out there with a hat. They've got sweatbands here and their hair's a bit of a mess. They got like, um, they got hiking pants on with like dirt all down the thighs. And they got these big chunky boots on with some like grass seeds and some burrs in the shoelaces. And there's this dirt trail sort of behind where they came in. So you, you're talking to a field ecologist and, um, and so they're, um, that they're, they're talk, talking she what she's saying is that she's like designed this um uh bush regeneration study she's been doing all this bush regen work and uh she's using invertebrates as a biodiversity indicator um she's sort of got lots of samples uh, like this she's got samples like this she used pitfall traps so she took these plastic containers and put some ethanol in the bottom and then put them in the ground just below the surface and so any invertebrates come along and they fall in there, you come back a couple of days later and see what's there. So she's done that. And she wants to know if, uh, if the bio, there's more biodiversity than there was sort of before, before they started working on this bush regen stuff. So there's, there's all sorts of things that have fallen into their pitfall traps. And uh, they got a matrix of data. So, so you, you say, okay, so what's, your, what's the data? Show me what you got. Um, and it looks a bit like this. They got a matrix where in the different columns, uh, we've got the different things that they sampled, the different types of invertebrate, and in the rows, we've got the different places that they sampled. Okay, so we need to think about the properties of the data. Um, so what are the main properties of data that looks like this? Well, um, you can see this, you see this column here with nearly all zeros, it's bugs. 
there are plenty of bugs around the place, but not many of them crawl along the ground and fall into a pitfall pitfall trap. They're mostly they're too busy sucking uh, all the goodies out of out of a nearby plant. And so um, you can see lots of zeros there and the occasional one. So the mean there is going to be small. The mean's near zero. And there's also not much variation from one place to the next. So the variance is near zero as well. If you look instead at the, the mites over here, you've got a big mean, right? The mean's sort of about 100, something like that. And uh, there's a lot of variation there. Sometimes it's C8, sometimes C100, you sometimes C400. So there's uh, a lot of variation. So when the mean is high, the variance is high. And when the mean's low, the variance is, is, is low. We get what's uh, called a mean variance relationship. It's a very strong one. Um, and so, you know, here's your rare species. Here's, here's your rare orders like the, your bugs. And up here, you've got your mites and your, your beetles and stuff. Uh, very strong mean variance relationship. And it's, it's, uh, it's like, a, in this case, it's about a hundred million fold range of variances between the, 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 the important, between the abundant ones and the rare ones. So that's a very, very strong feature in the data. And it's something that we need to think about. Um, if you were going to try and analyze it using some loss function, like, uh, you know, some, you fit some sort of uh, algorithm that's using some uh, mean squared error loss type thing, that's, that's not thinking about the variability. Uh, well, it, it's, it's just saying how different is my Y from my prediction. And if your data is quite variable, it's going to pay a lot of attention to that. If your data is not very variable, it's not paying much attention. So your model is just going to basically focus on mites. It's going to focus on the beetles. It's not going to care that much about, about bugs because there's not much variation there if you use that sort of loss function. So uh, we need to think about using methods that are going to account for the fact that some of these are much more variable than others. Otherwise, we're going to be ignoring those ones, these ones. And these ones are often the interesting ones. Sometimes, you know, if you're interested in endangered species, you're not going to get 100 of those, are you? So sometimes it's these rare, these small numbers that are the ones we care about. So, okay, so here's some methods uh, that uh, ecologists have been using a lot in the 90s and the 2000s. They're still used a, a bit now, but hopefully less than they used to be. But uh, those methods don't actually try and account for the mean variance relationship in the way they analyze the data. If you're going to use them to try and deal with it, you have to be clever about how you feed your data in, uh, basically, and, and often it doesn't work. Uh, so, uh, so this is a simulation. This is a power simulation. Uh, so the higher, the better. And if you're somewhere near this black dotted line, you've got basically no power at all to see patterns in your data. And in this simulation, I had there was there was one species which had an effect, and we're just seeing what happens as the variance of that species changes. And what you can see with these red and these yellow lines, they've got no power to detect uh, sort of patterns, quite strong patterns in a species for most of these species. It's only if it was an, if it was one of these high mean, high variant species that they actually start seeing patterns. Otherwise they don't see it at all. Um, so, all, you know, so we've collected data on 30 species. We might as well have thrown 25 from away using those methods. Yeah, so, so the properties are really key when you're analyzing data. You need to think what are the key properties of my data you need to account for them. Otherwise you might actually um, miss a lot of the story. So, so that's one big uh, data property for this for, for this particular example. Another one is that you've got many uh, correlated response variables. I call them response variables. I come from a stats background, so I think of responses, but machine learning, you might call them output variables. Uh, you've got many correlated outputs. So when there's lots of mites, you also get lots of beetles. So uh, if we don't account for this property, then what we're going to end up doing is we're going to see patterns when there's several correlated uh, response outputs all doing the same thing. And if there's something that's different to everyone else, we're not as likely to see that. That's, that's, that's what happens if you ignore correlation. So if there's something interesting that's going off on its own doing something different, we're less likely to see that unless we account for correlation between our outputs. Uh, a problem with this is that uh, the number of parameters in, uh, if you look at pairwise correlations, the number of parameters increases quadratically with your, with your number of, of outputs. So um, Emma earlier today, she had super exponential sort of uh, growth as the dimension increased. This is just quadratic. That's a much simpler problem, but it's still a problem. Uh, you know, if we got like 30 different types of invertebrate, we got almost a thousand, been under a thousand parameters we need to estimate using just you know these rows where like there's lots of zeros in them and stuff we don't have much data to estimate all those parameters so we need to be clever about how to 
how to deal with this problem if we want to try and estimate correlation and account for it when we have many uh, outputs. So how do we do this? Um, well, there's a bunch of different things you could do. Uh, this is a problem I've spent a fair bit of time working on. I, and I guess with the mean variance relationship, that starts by thinking about uh, generalized linear models and related methods. Uh, this is These are methods where you uh, think of your output, you specify a distribution for your output, which has some mean variance uh, relationship, and, um, and you, you go from there. Um, and uh, how do you deal with the outputs, the fact that you've got many correlated outputs? Well, uh, there's a few different ways, but one, help, one good way of approaching this, one way that often is helpful is to use a factor analytical model. And so what we're doing there is we're introducing to our linear predictor sort of some common, um, some common latent variables, some common unmeasured variables, which are going to induce correlation between things. If we introduce two latent variables, then what we're doing is we're basically uh, estimating correlation matrix using a thing with two columns. It's still got P rows for your P response variables, but it's only got two columns. So now what's happening is that when we try and fit this model, the number of parameters in the model is increasing linearly uh, with your responses rather than quadratically. So that this goes a lot further. We can use these sort of methods uh, to account for correlation uh, with wide data that you couldn't use you know, your unstructured correlation matrix is standard classical-ish approaches for. Okay, oh yeah, and so this is Maeve. Uh, so she's just writing up her PhD at the moment. And uh, many of you would have met her. I think she gave, came and, and talked to her there about some software she's been writing for the GLMMTMB package, which does this particular model. So GLMMTMB, if, if you fit mixed models, like if, like on R, LME4 is the most commonly used thing for fitting mixed models. Uh, this is like that. It uses the same syntax, um, and it's by the LME4 developers, but using sort of automatic differentiation to, to, to make it work faster and be more stable, and they added bells and whistles to it as well. And, uh, yeah, she's been adding this particular uh, bell, or is it a whistle? I'm not sure. Uh, a reduced, we call it RR, reduced rank, sort of correlation structures so that you can easily just just in the standard mixed model sort of uh, syntax on R, you can just um, yeah do a factor analytical model uh, fairly easily now, which is great. Okay, so that's that's a couple of examples of data properties that can be important and if you don't account for them, it can mess with your results. Um, I guess you know so what's the distribution of your of your output variable in particular a mean variance relationship do you have more, lots of them or just one are they correlated uh, with with each other in some way there's a bunch of different things that it's worth thinking about and uh, if you're thinking about this statistically what do these properties mean they mean you use a different model to analyze your data if you think about this from a machine learning perspective uh, well they can affect a couple of things but one key thing they should affect is your choice of loss function uh, like I mentioned, mean squared error before, that's not a good thing to do if you've got uh, uh, big changes in variance uh, between different in different sort of uh, um, observations. Okay, so that's your properties. That's the data properties. And now let's talk about research questions. So the question you, that you are trying to answer is key. It's key to how you analyze your data. It's key to how you collect data to start off with, how you design your study, how you collect your data and how you analyze it. Uh, the question should be one of your sort of guiding things all the way through uh, research. Uh, just as a simple example, let's look at this data set. I actually can't remember what this is. I think it's maybe silver chloride concentration. We're trying to estimate something like that. And we got two different methods. We got eight specimens there. How are you gonna plot this data set? Here's a few different plots that you could construct of this data set. Which one do you think is a good thing to do? I'll go back to the data set again, just to remind you of the data. We got two variables. We got eight specimens. We got these different measurements here on each eight specimens, MSI and SIB are the methods on eight specimens. Do we like a, let's just take a poll. You can, you can say yes to more than one plot if you like more than one plot. I'd like a show of hands for anyone who likes a scatter plot of MS, SIB against MSI. Excellent. We're liking scatter plots. It's good. What about this one? So B, it's a box plot of the differences between SIB and MSI. Does anyone like a box plot? Willem loves a box plot. It's good to see. Thank you. And uh, last one, uh, a mean difference plot. 
two key means dif mean difference plot. We got a difference plot against an average. Any takers? Yes, up the back. 50, 100, 150. Anyone for 150? Um, okay, excellent. So yeah, they're all they're all fine. They're all answering different questions on the same data set, but they're all they're, they're all fine for different questions. So A is you know how is SRB related to MSI? That's that would be a natural plot to use to answer that question. If you if you're saying well our SRB scores uh, do they tend to be larger than MSI? Then just focus on the differences, see if they're different from zero. Uh, the last one, um, do they tend to agree? Do these these are two different ways of measuring the same thing? Are they kind of agreeing with each other? We want to see if they scattered around that horizontal line there. So you know they, they, we got the same data set. We can analyze it many different ways. These are just three simple examples of that. So how you analyze data, it's it's it depends on your research question. It's it's not just about your data, right? So these are two key things that we always have to think about. And um, Okay, so here's some examples of some common questions and some common approaches you might use to answer those questions. Like uh, if you, a lot of people out there are interested in does this affect that type questions. If I design this new drug, is it going to give better patient outcomes? You know, um, that sort of stuff. Like a hypothesis test was, was designed for that sort of situation. So that's a, a good way to approach that. There's other ways too. Uh, estimating a quantity of particular interest, and we want to sort of uh, take in a, catch, capture the uncertainty, estimating that. You want some sort of interval for your parameter of interest. Um, a lot of machine learning type stuff is about predicting an output variable, and so I'd, I'd call that predictive modeling. Our goal is just to try and predict something as well as we possibly can. Um, okay, which input variables are important? Uh, so we've got some model to predict some output, and so which input variables matter? I guess you could call that model selection or variable selection, or you could do variable importance type stuff as well. There's a few different approaches to that. And look, you're just messing around, trying to find a pattern, looking for inspiration, seeing if, if anything stands out as being a thing. Uh, there's, you know, that's, there's a whole set of methods for doing that as well. So there's lots of different things you can do based on different types of questions. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, this is a pretty picture. I spent half a day on it. So I felt like I should show you this. It's in a, like a book. I wrote a book recently for ecologists on analyzing data. And um, and this is trying to capture all those ideas in, in one figure. It all start, it, it deliberately looks a bit like a plant in a pot. Um, it all starts with your research question. Everything grows out of there. You've got different directions you go in for answering different types of questions. But then you also have to think about your data properties. And uh, you know, there's all sorts of different features that feed into that you should think about and how you analyze your data should try and capture sort of key data properties as well and then it'll all blossom into a beautiful flower, maybe. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's your P's and your Q's, mining your P's and Q's. So um, let's think about uh, restoration. Has restoration been successful? So this is Michelle Lim's work. She's uh, finishing a PhD this year, uh, and she was helping some people uh, working in Operation Crayweed. So there used to be crayweed all up and down the coast of, of uh, Sydney uh, and elsewhere. Um, uh, yeah, so it's just the, this this stuff here. And uh, we uh, set up primary, you know, we just started pumping our sewage into the ocean, not that far off the coast, and uh, that killed a lot of it. Um, I think nutrients, probably something like that. Uh, anyway, it didn't like our poo, and so a lot of the a lot of the crayweed died. And uh, when they changed the, uh, they moved pups offshore, and they, I think they treat it better now as well. But uh, then uh, these, these guys started thinking about how to, it's a group run out of uh, Sydney Institute of Marine Science. Um, so uh, yeah, so Peter Steinberg and Adriana Verges and a bunch of people uh, are doing this. And uh, what they're doing is they, uh, they started trying to bring the, the crayweed back and they'd like to know if it's working. So has it been successful? So is the uh, restored sites uh, similar to the reference sites in, in some way? And they were interested in fish. Is it in terms, if you look at the fish communities, are they kind of similar? Okay, if you look at these questions here, it doesn't naturally fit into any of those. Uh, if we're saying, has restoration been successful? It's, it's not a natural fit to anything. I guess it's closest to the hypothesis testing. It's a bit like hypothesis testing, but we're not saying, does this affect that? We're saying, is this like that? So it's a slightly different problem. Um, a, a classical hypothesis test, you'd say, all right, my null hypothesis is, is that this is equal to that, and I want evidence that it's different. That's not what we want. We don't want to do that. We want to flip it the other way around. And we want to say, well, do we have evidence that this is similar to that? 
So that's kind of what we want to do, slightly different problem. So let's say we had just one fish species. We've got abundances for one fish here. Um, so a classical test would say, are we different from zero? Is there evidence that it's not zero? Um, what we actually want to do is we want to say, is there evidence that it's similar? So let's say we say, well, what we want an effect that's no more than this big. So here's a red dotted line for that big. And we want to say is, do we have evidence that it's less than there? And in this particular case, we'd be happy because we're less than that red line. We, our confidence interval for our effect, it's, it's less than that. So we're happy. Classical hypothesis test is also happy, but for a different reason, because we're not different from zero. Um, what if we had this situation here? We've just got a, a bit more variability in our, in, our, in our abundances. Then like we're not happy because we don't have evidence that we're less than 1.5. So, so we're not, we don't have evidence that restoration has been successful. Hypothesis test is saying, yay, we're not different from zero. Hypothesis test is, is not giving us the right answer. So, so we want to do something slightly different. A better fit for this problem would be something called an equivalence test. Uh, so in an equivalence test, um, we do have some threshold and we're looking for evidence that we're less than that threshold. It's used a lot in pharmaceutical work. Uh, you introduce a new drug, you want to make sure it doesn't do that different to the, the generic, doesn't do that different to this other, this other thing. Um, so yeah, we'd like something like an equivalence test uh, for restoration success. Um, what sort of, what, what's the okay, case? So that's our question. And so what about our data and our data properties? Well, Michelle's stuck with the same sort of data that, uh, that we, we saw before. Uh, she's got abundances of lots of different species of fish in different places. Some of them are restored, some of them are referenced. And we want to say collectively across these, uh, are they similar enough to say that, you know, restoration has been successful? So she's got this multivariate abundance data with the mean variance relationship. She's got that mean variance relationship. See this guy here. Um, yeah, so it's got a small mean. Okay, the mean's near zero. And it's not very variable. We're all getting ones, zeros, twos, threes, not much variance there. Whereas this guy, if you've been snorkeling around Sydney, this is bloody everywhere. Uh, so it's got a high mean. It's at this mean in this, in this sample. It's like 100-ish. And the variance is also quite large, you know, ranging from 30 up to 300. We've got a big variance. Big mean variance relationship. You want to deal with that. Otherwise, we're going to be just focusing on that now analysis and ignoring this. Okay, so, so Michelle's task is to design an equivalence test for multivariate abundance data, for data that has this mean variance relationship and also has many correlated outputs. Yeah, so I guess, so she's done that. She's, she's done that. She's, she's, she's been going great guns. I guess one of the big uh, challenges we had in doing this is how are we going to define effect size? So effect size, it's pretty easy to do if you've got just one species. You could just say, well, look at the mean difference or some standardized mean difference, but, but we've got lots of fish now. We've got like 50 different species of fish. And so what are we going to decide? Uh, like uh, we will consider restoration a success. If this fish is less than 0.5, if this one is less than 0.7, if, how, it's how are we going to do this and, and make it something that is, is easily applied, I guess, is easily used um, to, to come up with some idea of whether effects are big or small. Um, so what we ended up going with was uh, classifying species as increases, decreases, or no effects. So when we talked to our collaborators, they were quite happy to say, oh, yeah, I reckon this one's going to go up, this one's going to go down, this one's not going to do anything. Uh, and so having done that, then we've simplified the problem to just one parameter, which we'll call delta. And so then we can say, well, if it doubles, then that's bad news. So a delta of two means that these increases are doubling and the decreases are halving. Right, so, so then we've simplified the problem from having lots and lots of parameters to just really one parameter plus a bunch of decisions about increases and decreases. And I think they use tropicalization theory to, to, to help them decide that one. Um, there's no easy problem for how are you going to define effect size for across a whole bunch of, of variables. And, but this was sort of something that, that we, could, we could get an answer on. Yeah. Okay, so Michelle has defined has uh, written up some software for doing this. It's in the eco power package, uh, the equiv test function. You have to do a bit of work before you can apply that function. So you fit a model and then here's where she's defined which are increases and which are decreases and she defined an effect size. In this case, she went for 1.5, a 50% increase, or I guess that's a decrease by a factor of 1.5 uh, for the decreases. 
And uh, her results, it comes out looking like a hypothesis test, except instead of testing the hypothesis of no difference, it's testing for evidence uh, that the effect is less than 1.5. The p-value is one, which is, uh, that's not a small p-value. We do not have evidence of restoration success in this case. Uh, she's since been working on how to uh, uh, come up with a confidence interval for effect size. Uh, we've had a bit of success using a robbins munro uh, sort of um, a scheme to, to use an inversion to estimate the confidence interval. And uh, it ends up being that like, uh, so this wasn't significant. And I guess we got two problems going on here. The first problem is that the effect is still quite large. So our estimated effect is about three. <laughs> so that's like the increases are tripling in abundance <laughs> in the in the reference compared to the to the restored side. So the fish clearly are quite different. So that's one problem we've got. The other problem we have here is see how wide this confidence interval is. It's quite wide. Um, it's quite wide because we only had nine sites. We only had nine sites we were sampling at. Uh, it was that they had trouble finding sites, or um, I think they can get more, but at this stage they hadn't. And yeah, there's a very clear message here that they need to, to sample at more places in order to uh, get a more precise estimate. You sample more, your confidence interval gets narrower. And so then you're more likely to be able to say that you've got evidence of, of, of success. At the moment, it's just too wide. They're, they're gonna have some trouble with this. So that's, uh, that's that one. Okay, so now let's talk about the fish. Where's the fish? Okay, so Ben is doing his PhD, he's two years in. He, he loves fish, Ben loves fish, and he wanted to do some machine learning. And so he dragged me kicking and screaming into this problem. Uh, he is, uh, wanted to use baited remote underwater videos to estimate fish abundance, and he wants to use machine learning techniques to do it. The background to this is that he was volunteering as an undergrad student, and um, when he was in this lab one time where he was just sitting there watching lots of videos and manually writing down what he saw in them. It was a bit boring, took a long time. Lots of people do this. It's not just this lab. And uh, it would be nice to have some automated way to do this, to, to identify the fish and classify them. Turns out there are people doing this at the moment. What people do is they will take uh, images. They'll put boxes around the stuff they see in the images. And then they'll feed this into some machine learning algorithm um, to automatically uh, classify. Uh, sort of the to, to automatically identify to train it to identify fish and classify them um, to make your job a lot easier. Okay, so let's mind our P's and Q's, shall we? So the research questions, I guess there's a whole bunch of things you could be doing, but it's something to do with counting fish and knowing what they are. The um, data properties, uh, so what we're feeding into our algorithm is images, the images of fish that have been manually identified. But the thing is that we started off with videos, right? And fish move. I would have thought that you could um, do better in terms of deciding whether something's a fish or a rock using a video than using an image. Uh, the reason people aren't doing this is because it's hard. Uh, because, you know, people aren't going to sit and classify, you know, put boxes around every fish in, in the, you know, every single frame of a video. Um, and the algorithms, Google and Microsoft, there's all these, you know, big organizations that have defined, just derived, they've come up with sort of these fancy sort of pipelines for uh, object detection and classification are using image input. So basically, the, we've got the tools we have work on images, and it's quite hard to do anything more than images logistically. And so that's, that's why we're in this situation, but there's a clear mismatch between sort of um, the, the, the data we're feeding in and, and what we think we should be feeding in. Uh, as an example of that, can you see any fish in this image? Okay, I'll help you. It's a hard question. How about now? There may be more than one fish in this image. So let's let's take a, a quick vote. Uh, hands up if you think there is a fish in A. All right. Hands up if you think there's a fish in B. All right. B is looking good. C. Hands up for a fish in C. Okay, and D. Hands up for a fish in D. Okay, so there's not a lot of hands going up. But yeah, B, B, I think anyone who said B, well done. Look at this. You just press play, right? You just press play and it's a freaking fish and that's seaweed. That's all there is to it. 
So, yeah, I mean, animals move and rocks don't. So how about we use movement to help us decide whether something's an animal or a rock? Um, yeah, so how do we actually do this is, is another matter. So an image you can think of as like a matrix, three matrices. An image is like three matrices, uh, just these little pixels, right? And one of them is telling you how much red there is in the pixel, one of them is green, one of them is blue. Instead of doing that, the simplest thing I could think of for incorporating movement information while still using Microsoft's fancy sort of uh, pipeline for, for doing this stuff was to just use change in red and change in green and change in blue across neighboring flames, frames. And, and, and look at that. Now all that background is gone and we're just left with outlines of fish. So you'd think that putting this into, into an algorithm, into a classifier, it would do a bit better than uh, putting in the original image. Uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, it turns out it's been around for over 15 years. It's called frame differencing. But if we put these uh, frame differences into, into, into a, a regular old algorithm for, for doing this stuff, we end up doing, uh, certainly for this data set, we're doing a lot better in terms of uh, working out what's there. Uh, and so that's one thing we could do. There's plenty of other things you could do as well uh, that Ben's been thinking about. Uh, there's metrics beyond just looking at differences on neighboring frames. You can use multiple frames. Uh, optical flow is some tricky thing people do to look, look across frames to see what direction something that in, that's in a, a video frame is, what direction it's moving in and how fast. Uh, we could try and develop a new uh, sort of classifier that takes more input than just these three sort of uh, inputs, these R, G, and B. Uh, Ben's not liking that idea anymore because he doesn't feel like he can compete with Google. But um, You could try and track fish across uh, fragments, tubelets, and, and then use a video classifier. Although how well that works depends how good you're, uh, you've been able to, how well you've been able to track them. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of other things you could do too, but I think, uh, I think this is a direction that we should be moving in, sort of using movement information um, to try and detect and classify animals. Um, so we were just talking about fish. Uh, the same principles apply to, to camera traps if you use burst shots, right? So if you've got a, a bunch of quick images, uh, then you could just look at, you could use the same principles there. Uh, so, um, uh, so we had uh, infrared cameras of koalas earlier today. Infrared's not so great in the water, uh, but yeah, infrared would be good for wombats for sure, wouldn't it? But yeah, burst shots are to look at movements and it'd be interesting to see to what extent we can improve uh, methods for uh, classifying uh, terrestrial species uh, using, 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 uh, using movement information. Um, so we uh, so Ben's been talking to Mike Letnick, sort of a terrestrial ecologist at UNSW. Um, I guess the main thing he's interested in with camera traps is uh, just not having to sit there for ages uh, saying that's a false positive, that's a false positive. So these camera traps, they're set off by movement. Uh, they take a photo whenever there's movement. And so, you know, if there's a leaf that falls off a tree and blows in front of your view, then it takes a photo of that. And so he ends up, you know, they go out in the field, they come back a few months later, and they got 10,000 images and it's like false positive, false positive, false positive. And there's a lot of time spent on that. And so it, they, it'll be interesting to see if we can sort of um, um, screen out a lot of that uh, using these sort of ideas. These camera traps often work based on, they're triggered based on movement, right? So the camera traps are, are usually triggered based on frame differences. So why are we not using that information to analyze it if we're using it to decide whether to take the photo in the first place? Um, yeah, okay, so there's one more to go. That is climate change effects on species distribution. Sam's here. Uh, he's just uh, getting started on this project, but as an example of what you uh, might want to do, um, you know, you've got some species, you're interested in how it might respond to a change in climate. I like Angrofa costata, I'm a big fan, Sydney red gum. Um, yeah, so what people do, there's thousands of studies every year published on, on this, it's these methods are used a lot. You take sort of uh, information on where a species is found, where it's not found. And then you take these maps of climate predictors. Um, so um, yeah, usually people take static maps like from something like WorldClim, BioClim, these things are based on climate data from 1970 to 2000. And then they just come up with a bunch of metrics. Then, they, then you map it across with some digital elevation model. You just use elevation to try and interpolate and a few other things to, to come up with a surface like this. And what we do is we try and sort of predict uh, where things are as a function of climates. 
And then we say, well, okay, so what's the prediction for where this thing is? Um, and so, and if we were to change the climate, you know, what does that mean for where we think it's going to be? So this is done a lot. It's sort of, I've got the images the wrong way around, sorry, because it's going southwards under increasing climate, not polewards. Sorry, it's going polewards, not towards the equator. So yeah, images the other way. Anyway, um, yeah, so if we try and mind our P's and Q's, uh, so our research question is about climate change, climate change response of a species. We got data usually over a couple of decades of a species and um, we're using static maps of climate. Didn't we say climate was changing? Mm -hmm. So um, what we should be doing is we should be feeding in predictors, climatic predictors, which are a function of time, not just space. That's what we should be doing. And we should be trying to model uh, these as a function of time as well as space. We should be using a spatio-temporal model, right? Uh, but this is, like I said, there's thousands of, of papers on this every year and you won't see this being done in, in most of those papers. There are people thinking about these ideas, people with clever ideas on this, but it's not, it's not uh, where uh, the uh, standards are at the moment. And I think one reason is that it's hard to find. It's like there is a question of how do you, how do, you do a video, a fine resolution video of climate instead of just doing a static map. Um, so there's, and so there's, uh, there are people that know how to do this, but um, like making it this easy to find and easy to apply, you know, if you can, if you know the right person to talk to, you can get it, but there's, there's websites to download this sort of stuff. Um, you know, we need to make it easier to, to do it spatio-temporally rather than spatially. Okay. So that's the first question. How do we make this more, this stuff more, how do, how should we do it and how should we make it more accessible to people? And then there's the question of how do we do spatio-temporal models? There's a whole literature on how to do this, uh, you know, so it's, uh, but, but there's a question of, of making it easy for people to do, uh, I think, uh, in a good way, make it easy for them to do in a way that's, that's good for this sort of problem. So that's about it.